Good morning and welcome. My name is Ray Hendricks. I'm a friend of the family, long associated with family, and honored to be leading you this morning. Today we gather to remember the life and mourn the loss of John Klusterman. While we grieve John's loss, and we share that grief today, and while we will carry that grief from here, we also, in one of the conundrums or, or mysteries of the Christian faith, also get to celebrate today. Grief and celebration together. We get to do that because John was a child of God who loved the Lord deeply and fervently and as an expression of that love, also loved you, his family, so deeply and you, his family, so deeply. Those expressions of love were also expressed in the contacts that he made the people that he came into contact with, the mark of what becomes simply a Christian man living out his life. John was the loving husband of Margaret for just shy of 60 years. Wow. Wow. What a tribute. Loving father of Harold, who's married to Sue, Richard married to Michelle, Art married to Linda, and Jennifer married to Rob. Loving and devoted grandfather of 14 grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. Loving uncle of many nieces and nephews. If that wasn't enough, John came from a rather large family, 11 children of the late Hans and Itche Klusterman. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full, scriptures say. And in John and in his family, we get an expression of that. To bring God's word first is so important. And so I'm going to ask granddaughter Katie to come and share Psalm 23 with us. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, you have promised that wherever two or more are gathered there, you will be with us. We know that you are here today. We pray for your blessing. We pray for your comfort. And we pray for your peace as we now continue in this service. In your name we pray. Amen. John loved music. We know that. When John was still able to attend services, I can remember looking down to my right here, on your left side, right about where his brother is sitting today, and he would rise as we would sing, Hymn book in hand, even if the words were on the, on the overhead. Hymn book in hand, and he would have no trouble belting out those hymns that we, had, that we sang at that, at, at that time. So when I asked on Tuesday morning for, for some hymns, Richard had a list prepared for me. No trouble listing the, the favorite hymns of, of John. And today we're going to sing some of those hymns hymns, not only in memory of him, but knowing that as we sing those songs, it's a confession of our love for God. It's a confession of our wholehearted reliance on our Lord and Savior, and that it's our expression of the word of God 
being present in this place. So I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to begin our singing with 495. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known. So I invite you to stand. Let's sing 495. And yes, you need to get out your hymn books today and use your hymn book. God's grace, of course, is one of the resonant or foundational themes of the Christian faith. Its resonance is everywhere in Christianity. Beginning with scriptures, through the great theologians, and in the lives, in the lives of those who love God, our Savior, and our Redeemer. John understood this. Let me explain. One Sunday, when I first, early on, when I started preaching, um, John would wait for me downstairs. So when church was over, John would find his place in the basement. I don't, don't know if you remember, but they, it was sort of this back corner where they would stand with a few of them, right? And they would have coffee and, and they would talk. As we sipped on our coffee on one of those mornings, uh, John, John, John told me a story. And I think there was something in that story that he didn't want to really criticize my sermon, but he wanted me to to get the message. And he said this. He said, Ray, every good sermon, every good sermon emphasizes the grace of God. He said, every good sermon that is spoken talks about the redemptive power of our Savior and the faithfulness that he has. Don't forget that. Obviously, I've never forgotten it. When John tells you something, you don't forget it. So um, in this case, however, it was that correctness that got me. And so how fitting that our first two hymns that we are singing emphasize this grace of God. So let's sing together 462, Amazing Grace. You can stay seated for this. It's warm. (laughs) And so staying seated, um, let's sing together 462. At this time, the, um, the family would like to do some reflecting on the life of John. We're going to begin with grandson Alexander. Then two of the self-proclaimed in-law grandchildren are going to sing one of his favorite hymns for us. And then uh, Art will wrap up uh, for the family after, after they have sung. Alexander? It's a, an honor for me to share this morning on behalf of the grandchildren some memories and lessons we have learned from our grandfather. Listening to you um, share now about grandpa's emphasis on grace, it makes a whole lot of sense. The first characteristic of grandpa that I wrote down is his profound sense of gratitude. And I saw that this is in the bulletin as well, that grandpa had the deepest sense of gratitude of anyone that I've ever met. And if you know uh, the scriptures, you know that thankfulness is the deepest fruit of grace. That thankfulness is one of the most profound fruits of a a life that has experienced grace, the freeness of a gift. I've never met a man who was more grateful than grandpa, Grandpa, and I've not learned what it means to be grateful or seen it more fully lived out than in the life of our grandpa. If you think about it, his gratitude impacted everything that he did. All of us grandchildren can remember at some point hearing Grandpa tell us stories of the sadness and the pain that he and his family experienced in the Netherlands under the occupation. If you've read his memoirs, which I would encourage you to do, you would have some idea just how impactful this time in his life was, as I'm sure many of you know yourself. But perhaps the only thing more pervasive than his memories of suffering, even after all of these years, was his profound sense of gratitude and the joy he experienced at the liberation. If you know Grandpa, there's few things that are so pervasive in a sense of sadness and loss, but the one thing that might be more profound is his sense of gratitude at the liberation. Perhaps the only tears that match the intensity of his sadness were the tears of joy and thankfulness that he often showed us. This was a lesson for all of us as his grandchildren. I haven't met a more patriotic citizen than my grandfather. The nursing staff told me this week 
with great endearment how Grandpa would wake up, they'd hear him singing at 3 a.m. the Canadian National Anthem. <laughs> singing in his bed all by himself, and, and his, his neighbors didn't like him much, but they thought it was so endearing. And uh, after all of these years, he would get up and he would sing. He was a man who appreciated what he had because he knew what it meant to go without. He was a man, it seemed to me, who was constantly rejoicing in his freedom. It wasn't something that happened. It was just every day, Grandpa got up out of bed and said, thank you. He said, I'm happy to be alive. I'm thankful for what I have. He was a man who was constantly rejo rejoicing. This was followed by a deep sense of gratitude for his liberators and a love for Canada. But really, this is the pattern of our faith. As I said, the grace of God in Jesus Christ is a liberating love. True faith is constantly being expressed in gratitude to God for his great salvation, freeing us from bondage to self, to sin, to death, to our enemy. True faith wakes up every day like Grandpa, happy to be free. And you can't appreciate your freedom until you felt the pain of oppression. Grandpa's memories of pain only fueled his sense of joy at his freedom. And there's a lesson here for us. Often, when I was coming to church, we think about the suffering that Grandpa faced and how it doesn't seem fair. But Paul says that our afflictions prepare for us a greater joy. And we saw that a little bit in Grandpa's life. The things that he faced early on, that many of you have faced early on, are what led him to be the happiest man I knew. Grandpa would not have been the same man had he not faced those things. He simply would not have. His joy would not have been as deep as it was. We need to consider this in the trials that we face and the trials of loved ones, that God is merciful and he is working out for our good, even in these things. That leads me to the next point, that Grandpa was marked by cheerfulness and joy and laughter. The Klustermans loved to laugh, and I think a lot of that comes from Grandpa. The author, author of Proverbs wrote, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Sure, we are a serious bunch, as you know. Sometimes we take ourselves a little too serious. We argue when we shouldn't, but as long as I can remember, and my cousins would say the same, Grandpa was marked by laughter. And it was the best kind of laughter, the kind that caused his eyes to well up with tears as if he just couldn't contain his joy. Anyone who knows our family knows this trait got passed on to his children and his grandchildren, although probably not as strongly as it did to Uncle Art and Aunt Linda and their beautiful children. I don't think anyone has ever been introduced to our family and not come away commenting on the infectious nature of their laughs, the happiest sound you've ever heard, medicine for the soul. There's a time to work and there's a time to cry. There's a time to hurt and to be solemn. There's a time to fight and there's a time to rest. But there's also a time to laugh as the wise king wrote. There's a time to sit back with thanksgiving, consider that which brings us joy, to put down the sword, to put down the trowel, to gather your family and loved ones around, and to simply laugh together. Life is hard and sin and death are real, and he knew this, but so is our hope in Christ. Some enemies can't be defeated by force, by argument, by persuasion, but rather through the resolve not to give in to despair. Laughter as he taught us, takes faith. Grandpa taught us this. As he shuffled around the house, many of my cousins commented on his shuffling, especially in his latter years, more like a dance. As a shuffle that I can't really describe, you'd have to see it yourselves. Often the shuffle would be accompanied with a little hum to some tune that he knew. Grandpa loved to sing. As he made his way to his next love, the food table, Grandpa was simply the happiest man in the room. As Danny put it, he demonstrated a childlike wonderment about the world. And this only intensified until the end. But lest I give the wrong impression, Grandpa's laughter was not a symptom of triteness. It was not levity. There is a temptation to ignore and escape the weight of life by making light of things that matter. And this is pervasive. And we all do this. But this was not Grandpa. Grandpa was a man marked by solemnity, a sense of gravity for what mattered, joined with a passionate intensity to live out his convictions. 
I learned from an early age, sitting in his living room floor, that there are things that matter. There are things that matter. There are consequences to our ideas, our thoughts, our actions. And we should take seriously and care passionately about how we live and love in this world. I can't tell you the specifics of many discussions. That's what the Klustermans call arguments. But I learned as a child that things do need to be discussed. You need to talk. And a lot of families can't. All of our spouses came into our family. Uh, it's probably the same for you guys. But they just the first thing they said was, you guys are really intense. I mean, you guys are nice. And then we come into the family home, and there's all this fighting. And I'm like, we're not fighting. Just, we're just hanging out. You should see our fights. <laughs> In an age that is so individualistic, you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, so relativistic, whatever is good for you, there's no consequences to our actions. The worst thing you can do is say, no, that's wrong, or that's right. The greatest offense today is not that you would commit evil, but that you would say something is evil. And in this climate, those living room talks were a firm foundation, informative for all of us, I'm sure. Of course, we wouldn't agree on everything, but that's not the point. Grandpa wasn't trying to raise clones. He was trying to nurture and train us all to care deeply about what was important and to have the courage and passion to live it out. And I would encourage you all to continue in that. The next characteristic of Grandpa that my cousins mentioned that was pervasive is his pride in all of, this, all of us. While there was a seriousness to Grandpa, it did not in any way mask his pride in all of his grandchildren. He was so eager to know and encourage us in all of our endeavors. From soccer games at Maple Leaf Park, followed by ice cream, of course. I'm sure he ate the first one. To school, to graduations, to our careers, our spouses and children. Grandpa was intensely interested in all of our lives and let each of us feel his delight in us. So many of my cousins expressed in many ways the delight Grandpa took in us. And the delight of the father, or the grandfather in this case, is one of the world's most potent motivators. The delight of a father is one of the world's most potent motivators. He was the kind of man you wanted to make proud, and yet the quickest to express his delight. There are not many men like that. Grandpa was also the most welcoming man. Grandpa always got up out of his chair to welcome his guests, especially his granddaughters, who we affectionately greeted with a kiss. Those we brought into the Klusterman family gatherings were always warmly welcomed by Grandpa, including first-time girlfriends or boyfriends. At the wedding of Justin and Katie, he approached Rebecca the first time he'd ever met my wife, and he told her, you're an angel, and you're perfect together. I didn't know Grandpa was a prophet, but I was given my hearty amen and confirmation to that. I can testify that what he speaks is true. Well, it ended up working out. All of these characteristics of Grandpa are owing to his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the fruit of his faith. They are not the root. Fundamentally, as we heard, Grandpa was a redeemed man. We, as his grandchildren, were blessed to see, even from a distance, with a glimpse, the life of a man of faith. He was faithful to his Lord until the end. The first thing he told me when I went to see him at St. Joseph's for the first time was that he believed in Jesus and that he was a Christian. The second thing he told me was that he loved his wife. Even as his mind and his body failed him, he remained faithful. In closing, it's only fitting as grandchildren, as we consider Grandpa, that we consider obligation as his grandchildren. It would be wholly unfitting to settle with nice words that sat on the surface of our hearts and did not move us as he would want. I thought I would read from Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. The author writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The witnesses the writer speaks of are those who have gone before, those who have run their race. 
It's not a physical race for the spiritual one, keeping their eyes on Jesus. Grandpa ran his race. He ran his race. It's not the race we would have chosen. And it's not the race we would have expected. It didn't end at first glance in victory, and yet we know by faith that it did. Jesus did not just begin his faith, but he finished it as he said he would. He got him through. I had the privilege of seeing and hearing Grandpa's last breath. And the sorrow of seeing a man who was so strong, so frail, and so overcome. But I had the honor of seeing him finish his race. He entered his master's rest and he received the crown. His faith that was once dim has become his sight and his joy is complete. The happy tears are happier. The shuffle has turned to a run. The laughter is a lot louder and the singing without end in the kingdom of his savior. He wants that for you. Until we meet again, Grandpa. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy
Good morning. It's a sad day, but it's a good day. And we had a great evening last night as a family. It was so nice to see everybody come by and uh, give us their support. And uh, we enjoyed it thoroughly. And I'd like to share some thoughts and, and stories of uh, what my dad was to us and some experiences. He had a good life, 84 years, and only the last two years, 18 months, were tough. But there's a lot of people that have it worse, and he knew that, so we're thankful for that. Our dad. Our dad wasn't a big drinker, but he did enjoy a good happy hour, especially around Mental Timmer's barbecue. After some quality time fishing, the boys, dad and Cor, would gather and watch Mental cook up the victory of the day with much animated conversation and tears rolling down their face and laughter. When dad could see things were progressing at the end, the cookout Sorry, when Dad could see things were progressing and the end of the cookout was near, he would inform Menno, slow it down. Slow it down, Menno. Maybe another drink could be poured without the women knowing, and maybe stories could be shared, and even a funny little song from back home. The good time was to be savored. Our dad was born in the year of 1930, he had four brothers and six sisters. He was in the age group of the younger half, and anyone with older siblings know you either sink or swim with that kind of competition. <laughs> Our dad was a swimmer. Obviously, the war had left a huge mark on our dad's life, as it was during his formative years. After he retired, he decided it was time to vocalize some of these reflections with a book. He would get tears in his eye, or sorry, ironically, the book is entitled, I Remember. He would get tears in his eyes every time he told the story of Holland's liberation by the Canadian troops with their nonchalant march up the streets as they pushed the Nazis back. Brave men indeed. In 1950, at 19 years of age, he was the first to leave his family behind in Holland and immigrate to Canada, the country that had meant so much to him just a few years back. In 57, he married the love of his life, Margaret de Groot, and soon had three sons and one daughter. For extra money, mom and dad did market gardening. One year, they rented land and wanted to plant strawberries, among other things. The strawberry plants came in bales, and an automatic planter was rented. However, the planter broke down and the ground was so parched, so instead of throwing their hands up in defeat, they did what had to be done, plant one plant at a time. Pushing the hands, or sorry, um, pushing the talcum powder-like soil open, insert the plant and pack the powder around it. Walk to the river, get a bucket of water, and give every little sprig a drink of water. After a few weeks, it looked like they might have a victory on their hand, but this was not to be. A summer storm approached, and with torrential rain, washed most of the plants out of their parched ground. The sight was sickening. Dad says that they were flat broke because of this, maybe even more, but they had not given enough thought to realize at the time. Undeterred, they continued on for years. And I have to add a little footnote here. That was such a significant moment in my dad's life that he actually said to mom just a few weeks ago, maybe we should plant strawberries again. <laughs> but he also said a few weeks before that, should we have another baby? Dad's positive attitude towards life was not to be squashed. 
Friday night, Dad would put concrete blocks under the bumper of the 56 Buick because the suspension couldn't hold the weight. Load all the vegetables and potatoes bound for the market he could fit into the car. Early Saturday morning, Dad would put the car in gear, roll the, con roll off the car off the concrete blocks, and drive out the laneway with the bumper dragging on the ground. Saturday afternoon would yield a tidy profit for a week of hard work and a feeling of thankful contentedness for a job well done that would wash over mom and dad for a day. Then it was back at it again on Monday. As children, dad had always given us plenty of rope to either hang ourselves or perform. He had confidence in the latter. We were all driving the family car at a very young age. At some point, the neighbors had a racetrack in the field next to their house. Rich and Harold were allowed to take the family car, the 56 Buick, to the neighbor's field and race around the track, sliding sideways and having a blast. One day, Dad decided to go for a ride with them, and a nine-year-old Richard showed Dad how it was done. <laughs> he could barely reach the gas pedal and look over the dash, board at the same time while exercising some moves in the car. Just as, just, Dad just laughed and was impressed. If only he knew how much of a foreshadow this was to Richard's future driving <laughs> talents. <laughs> when I was 14 or 15, my dra dad dropped me off at a site for an addition. I wasn't even sure I could figure out how to square the building up and start the right elevation for the excavation but he told me I'd figure it out and be fine. And off he went. And it was. A quiet expectation that made you want to rise to the occasion. Dad also had a, uh, an edge among all this positive attitude and contentedness. The politics of, or sorry, the subject of politics and religion have presented many an opportunity over the years for my father and his brothers to impose their version of the truth upon each other. <laughs> All my dad's family are swimmers. <laughs> Sometimes it got a little hot. But as Alex suggested, we were only discussing. <laughs> dad loved Jesus and he loved this church. He was passionate for what he felt was right for the church and its people. He gave freely of his time, never seeing it as a burden or having to do it. It is what you do period. Countless times as an elder and deacon anything, and anything else that came up for that matter, he lived to serve his church and God. The passion also showed up if you're watching a hockey game with him. You spoke maybe when the play stopped, if the announcer wasn't saying anything significant to the play, but mostly between periods. And if you forgot these rules, you were stopped by a forceful, quiet now. <laughs> Being raised like this left a definite mark on me. One night, I went to watch the game on TV with uh, our neighbor, Don Dunford, and he proceeded to ask me how my work was going and what jobs we were working on. While the players were still skating and the announcer was still talking. <laughs> I had no idea how to respond to my host who had just committed this cardinal sin. Another time, an, an inexperienced building inspector was giving us a hard time about something he should have been up on but wasn't. At first, Dad let it roll off his back, and this, uh, as the second meeting approached, Rich and I were getting quite agitated, to say the least. In between the second and third meeting, Dad spewed forth some pearls of wisdom. Try not to let this guy get to you, he said. Don't let it roll off your back. Don't worry about it. Okay, Dad, we'll try our best. Two minutes into the meeting, the third meeting, Dad totally loses it. <laughs> to, the to the point I wondered if he was going to deck the man or not. We came to a common understanding. Another time, we were doing renovations to the exterior of a house for a few weeks. Inside was an annoying little dog that Rich and I taunted in hopes that we could get it outside and rough it up a little bit. <laughs> no luck. The last day came and we we're cleaning up. Dad went to the front door with the invoice to collect. 
He rang the doorbell, and the lady of the house answered the door. Next thing I heard was that dog all of a sudden barking and growling at Dad. It had startled Dad as well, and his reflexes told him to kick, ask questions later. <laughs> After a loud Dutch word that was exclaimed in a steel-toed boot to the chops, the dog let out an agonizing yelp. The, da the dog backed off with the lady of the house exclaiming, oh my. <laughs> Satisfied the situation was in hand, Dad returned to his polite customer as first self and gave her the bill. He waited like a gentleman for her to write the check and thanked her for the work. <laughs> Not a peep was heard from the dog. <laughs> After some years, he did mellow with age. When I was about 13, I had bought my neighbor's Peugeot car. It had no brakes, they said, and wouldn't start, they said. $30, sold. After a few days, I figured out what was broken and got it to run again. It had a four-speed in the tree, and I could get her up the third flying around the field next to our house. Satisfied one day, I'd turn laps not even Mario Andretti could beat. I brought my trusty machine back to the stable. The no brakes thing was never an issue before. I merely coasted into the laneway and parked. On this particular day, I came roaring into the laneway and realized my predicament too, too late. I slammed into the closed garage door with the 75 Caprice Classic on the other side. If, I, if it hadn't been for the car, I would have been into the family room. The car was fine, the garage door was totaled, and a fender popped off the side of my Peugeot. Dad, being wakened from his Sunday afternoon nap, came out, looked at me, looked at his door, looked back at me, said very calmly, you owe me a new door. He turned around and proceeded to go back to his nap. <laughs> Our dad could sleep anywhere. 50 minutes was all he needed after lunch. It was all he needed, but it was never missed. Didn't matter, he could be at home, on vacation, park bench will work just fine, or visiting someone. His nap was the sign of a clear conscience, he would say, and that that calling should not be ignored. <laughs> when he retired, he took up the game of golf and soon found an excellent playing partner, one who enjoyed the game, who was a gentleman, and he could have a good conversation with. The bonus was with this gentleman is that he had been in the Army and landed on Juneau Beach, June 6, 1944. He had also been to Holland. His name, Mike Best. These common threads had galvanized a great friendship. Once a week, the two played and conversed. The odd time, someone else joined them due to course rules, but this never bode well as they always regretted having a stranger interrupt their time together. When Harold and Rich and I went to Juneau Beach with Dad, it became our objective to find Mike's objective on June 6, 1944, a church, I believe, about a quarter mile inland. With quiet contemplation, he took the whole situation in, and I am quite sure in his mind's eye, he saw that day as Mike had described it to him and saw the same buildings now as Mike had then. Tears filled his eyes. In Dad's eyes, Mike Best was one of those troops who had marched in his village pushing back the Nazis. I believe Mike Best to be my dad's hero. Two years ago, October, Dad went for a seemingly innocent look drive to look at the fall colors. His life turned for the worse, his memory let him down, and he didn't know how to get home. On the way home, knowing full well what had happened that day, he kept saying, Margaret, it was supposed to be such a nice day. When he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, 
his simple philosophy of positive attitude and accepting God's will for him carried him through with calm indeed. Not beating him, he didn't see it that way, just like the strawberries. I'm here to tell you today that my father knew the answer to the most sought after question in the world. What is the secret of life? The secret of life is being content with what you have at any given time of your life. Don't mistake in that for complacency. You do the best you can for each and every day, for God, your fellow man, your family, and yourself. At the end of the day, you should be able to look into the mirror and say, I did the best I could with what I had. During today's services, Dad's favorite hymns are being played, and it is no wonder that he has gleaned the wisdom of these hymns and inserted them into his philosophy of life. He has had trials and tribulations. My dad has loved and been loved. And as we pause today to reflect on his life and the man he was, and I know he is in a better place with no pain, I still want to be selfish and ask God to slow it down, not so fast. We love you, Dad. Veltrusta. Deep breath. Wow. Art, Rebecca and Katie, Alexander, thank you so much. To hear, to hear the words of children and loved one express the love for a father, no greater thing. We're going to sing because we need to sing. <laughs> Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. John's life, consecrated to a life of serving God. Take my life. Hymn number 289, and I think you need to stand up for a minute because you've been sitting a long time. Let's stand. Hymn 289. The passage we're going to reflect on for just a few moments is, is out of Job 19, verses 25 to 27. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed and yet, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. I know that my Redeemer lives. When we gathered at the funeral home on Tuesday morning, I asked if there was a favored passage of John's or theirs that they would like to have as central to this meditation. Margaret, who had been suitably quiet and, and understandably quiet at this point, just having heard about John's passing, was quick to interject with this story. When John's Alzheimer's had grown worse, family members would come and sit with him doing puzzles or games to keep his mind active. His memory would come and go as would conversation. One day, he was sitting doing puzzles with a family member when suddenly he said, I know my Redeemer lives. I know my Redeemer liveth. That story is at the same time both wonderful, but also unsurprising. It's been my experience, limited as, as that experience is, that those struggling with memory loss, struggling with such a disease as beset John in his later years, will also allow for or reveal moments of unexplainable lucidity. Some of the things that we've heard from the from, from the stories before. In, with such a confession which comes from the depths of the heart and from the essential parts of a person's life which will come to the surface at those moments and reveal something about the character of the person. This particular statement comes from the passage we've just read in the book of Job. You're familiar with Job. Job, a man who was blameless and upright and then according to Cornelius Vanderwall in his commentary on Job, 
The Lord gave Job's possession into the hands of Satan, and soon Job was grieving the loss of his land and his family, all of his worldly possessions. Satan had asserted that Job only loved God or blessed God because of the things he had been given. But as Job mourned, he also sang that as God giveth, he also taketh away. And as the book of Job tracks on, there's this conversation between Job and his friends, a dialogue, a discussion perhaps in the Klusterman version of it. In chapter 19, we get this amazing confession from Job. Here he is, a man who has cursed the day of his birth, a man his fellow beings now loathe, they can't even look on him, and he seems to have been condemned by God. And yet Job clings to this invisible God with the wonderful confession of this passage, I know my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, he will stand on this earth. The beautiful thing about this passage is that Job recognizes that life in Jesus Christ issues from what is just. Isn't Christ ultimately the answer to Job's complaints? Isn't Christ the one through whom justice is satisfied? Isn't he the one who made man righteous before God by bearing our sins? That's why he is the source of life and the source of resurrection. Christ rose from the grave for our sins, for our justification. It's not without reason that Job's words of confession resonate widely in our Christian culture, form the basis for our hymns that we sing, why they are picked up in Handel's Messiah in one of the beautiful moments of that Messiah, and why John would quote these words in a time where his memory comes back to him. I got to know John at a couple of levels, just as any of us get to know the people we interact with. I have fond memories of John's involvement while at, Christian, at Rima Christian School. In the early years, he made Richard and Art work a whole winter building an addition onto our school. And I heard from Richard that they went from Trent Winds to Rima Christian School. From one distinct group of people to another, I hope. But uh, Rich and Art spent the better part of that winter building the building. John and I spent the better part of that winter just chatting together, watching Art and and uh, Richard work. And then many years later, he and Corvin Drunen spent the better part of spring and summer building this beautiful soccer field out behind Rima Christian School. Most of you don't know this story, but there's a great story of those two coming and uh, building this soccer complex behind the school. Again, Cor did the work. John and I spent the summer discussing many of life's issues having those discussions while we watched other people work. Relevant for us this morning, however, is that I know from those conversations that John would express frustration if praise for a person made that person larger than life or gave the appearance of sainthood. And so today, inherent in our understanding of this passage needs to be a common theme of what John would have long confessed. And that is that in our own power, we can do nothing. You heard those themes through Alexander and through Art. John rested and resonated in this faith that he had in Jesus Christ, and his strength came through that. In and of our own selves and our own power, we can't restore our lives, ourselves. As fallen creatures living in a broken and sinful world, we can't overcome or defeat sin and evil on our own. Our deeds and actions, as important as they are, are not what makes us saints. It is only through the redemptive power of God's resurrection, God redeeming, that anything truly has meaning. His book of remembrance during the time of war, 
this book of remembrance, gives us an insight into the generation of people who well understand difficulty and hardship. He describes with some humor, I thought it was hilarious, um, and yet with deep insight the struggles of a family to survive in Holland in the Second World War. We get amazing insights into the character that was John Klusterman. He kicked a German soldier's bike with his clumpin' and then wondered why he got chased down the street. Or he threw a hardball at a German officer's car only to have to flee with them chasing him pistols in hand. In the midst of these stories, there was that recognition of a mother's faith, depending on the grace and mercy of her God to sustain and protect her children. It doesn't surprise me that these words, words of Job resonated with John. He was part of a generation that understood because they saw and lived through both the worst and the best of this world. A generation with whom the story of Job actually resonated. Because of those experiences, John, in a very unique way, I believe, understood redemption as only someone who has experienced liberation can. Let me read a passage from the book. It comes from chapter 24, now liberated. And when you have been liberated, a dance breaks out. No, it has nothing to do with a waltz or a foxtrot but a street dance. All you do, both rich and poor, young and old, you join arm in arm. You start moving forward while swaying side to side, row upon row, till the main street is awash in body movement, not silently, spontaneously hooting and hollering belongs with it. When the lead row has reached the end, spontaneous chaos takes over for a while. And for all those rows of swaying, people have to turn around. Now lined up again, the beat goes on and on. By late evening, when all others are pooped, the energetic line up the street deck meets the elevated sidewalk now moving forward. One foot up, one foot down. Now increase your pace to a more vigorous pace. One, two, three, one, two, three, on you go till all your energy is zapped. You did this when your community was liberated. You repeated that all over again when your country had been liberated and all over again when the guns fell silent all over the world. Only now the Canadian soldiers joined in arm in arm. This is what happens when peace breaks out, when you walk home by yourself, when you are near your house, when the noise has subsided, the still of the night takes over. Your thoughts wander to those still imprisoned. No, I can't. I may not forget you. But I'm going back to the main street tomorrow evening, for we are free, unbelievable, unbelievable. Thanks, vets. Repeat after me. Thanks, vets. At the end of the day, I want to urge you as we reflect on the words of Job, as recalled by John, that our life confession must be that I know that my Redeemer lives and that someday he will stand upon the earth and we will look upon him with our eyes. You see, my friends, it's that confession that allows us to live in this broken world with a sense of purpose, with peace in violent times, with joy in difficult days, and with confidence in times of tribulation. It also calls us to remember that in times of affluence, we too know and recognize that all of this is a gift from our Redeemer, our Savior, and our Father in heaven. At the end of the book, John leaves us with a song, a poem. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God as our Father, brothers all are we. Let me walk with my brothers in harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now you recognize this. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth. 
Let it begin with me. My friends, that peace at this moment, that peace beyond all understanding in a time of grief is possible for each and every one of us. But it begins with the confession of Job. I know that my Redeemer lives and that he shall one day stand on this earth. This earth is his. And as his Redeemer in his grace, our lives can be filled with the joy of being liberated and the peace that passes all understanding. May that peace be yours today. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, the peace that passes all understanding can only come from our knowledge of you. Our knowledge of you as Redeemer, as Lord, as creator of this world. Lord, we pray for that peace. We pray for this time when we are grieving that that comfort may come to us. But Lord, may it come through us through the acknowledgement that you are our Savior, you are our God, you are our Lord. And when this peace passes over us like a river, may we acknowledge too that all is well with John and all is well with us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Another of his favorite hymns, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Let's stand and sing hymn number 489. If you would turn to the back of your hymn books, 813, or if you know this off by heart, I'd like us to say together or read together the Apostles' Creed. 813 in the back of your hymn books. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It's in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, that did today we commend to Almighty God, our brother John. It's into your tender hearts, O God, O merciful Savior, that we entrust your beloved servant. You've received him into the arms of your abiding mercy and into the rest of your everlasting peace and into the glorious company of those who dwell in your light. And may your kingdom of peace come quickly he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus. On behalf of the family, I want to thank you for, for coming today, for your participation in this service. A meal has been prepared for us downstairs, a time of socializing and greeting sharing thoughts and memories. We want to invite you down for that. Julie, Dawson, thank you. Thank you for what you've done today. For Linda, for the last minute preps on this, we're, we're very thankful. And we recognize, again, that as we go, we go as a family and a community together to share in this time. As we sing the last hymn, during the last verse, we as a family will, will leave and then we invite you to follow us out and downstairs afterwards.
this word of blessing. As we go from here, we know we go with God's blessing because he promises to bless us. He promises that he will keep us. He turns his face toward us, and it's his countenance that shines on us. We go in the knowledge that his comforting spirit will be with us. Amen. Our final song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, 556.